Good evening, everybody. Welcome. I'm Mike Wabacker. Welcome to this week's very special edition of Thursday Night Live, the Monarch's Amazing Migration, a status report. I'm Mike Wabacker, the executive director of the Schuylkill Center. Tonight is a, um, something of a yin-yang story about the Monarchs, and we'll get to that in a moment. But first, let me introduce the Schuylkill Center for all of us who might not un, uh, might be new to the center. There we go. Ah, let me back up. I'm in the wrong place. There we go. So we'll be recording tonight. It's gonna to be uploaded to the Google Center's YouTube channel so you can view it later. So if you don't wanna be seen by video, we recommend that you just turn the video off. Uh, also keep your microphone on mute uh, while listening. Also uh, get questions in chat. So when Dr. Taylor is done, we'll be adding, well, I'll be asking questions from chat. Tonight is also closed caption. We have that possibility. So do check out the button on the lower right if you want to close captioning. We'll be screen sharing during the presentation. Suggest you use the side-by-side -side viewing option. So look under viewing options, uh, select side-by-side -side from the drop-down menu. And as I mentioned, keep putting questions in chat. If you don't know the Schuylkill Center, we're located in Upper Roxborough at the top of Philadelphia. We've got about four miles of walking trails free. Come for a walk anytime, lots of people do. It's been especially handy in the pandemic. We have been doing a wide variety of educational programming. Uh, for people of all ages, school groups, all the way up into adults like tonight. So check out our website, schoolcentercorg for more of our programming. We operate Nature Preschool, one of the first nature preschools in the state of Pennsylvania, where our kids are outside, three, four, five-year-olds are outside learning every day. We're really thrilled to be uh, presenting that program. Um, we also operate a very ambitious environmental art program with indoor and outdoor exhibitions. Uh, this is an ash tree, but of course ashes have been compromised by the emerald ash borer, so the show is called All Fall Down. Um, as an ashes, ashes, we all fall down, and so sculptors actually did things with ash trees across the site. And right now the current show is Al Mudif, a confluence. Mudif is the Iraqi word for the Arabic word for a guest house. Um, Iraqis in the lower Mesopotamian Valley have been building mudifs like this out of reed grasses for 5,000 years. Um, and an Iraqi uh, immigrant to Philadelphia uh, living near Roxborough discovered us and is part of a, a group of nature centers across the region who are doing installations with Phragmites or uh, an invasive reed grass not native to the United States. He asked if he could make a mudif out of the Phragmites, and we said, of course. And as best we can tell, this is the first mudif built outside of Iraq in 5,000 years. So come see it at our nature center. I'd uh, love to have you. And there's an indoor exhibition that goes with it as well. Plus another artist, Sarah Kavich, has uh, done sculptures with Phragmites that are uh, essentially furniture, so benches, wonderful benches that you can sit on. So you have a Phragmites bench to sit and look into the Mudif or uh, go into the Dief, Mudif. And as I mentioned, there's uh, an indoor exhibition in our art gallery that complements the Mudif and explains the story behind it. So come see that. It's actually technically open through the end of October, which is only next week. We're gonna extend it into a little bit into November, but then uh, the next show will be going up pretty soon thereafter. So come see the Mudif. We operate the only wildlife clinic in the city of Philadelphia, uh, helping injured, orphaned, sick animals of actually 150 species have come over with more than 30 years. That's wonderful work. That's a red tailed hawk they're working on. Um, here's a baby squirrel, uh, one of the most common animals brought, abandoned baby squirrels uh, brought to the nature center. So our wildlife clinic does important life-saving work. We are a volunteer organization. Lots of people come like the fanatic on a couple of birthdays ago. Uh, helping us plant trees. So you can volunteer on our website. We're also a membership-based organization. If you're a member, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. If you'd like to join, we'd love to have your membership. You get advance notice and discounts on programs. And of course you get um, discounts in our gift shop, which features some of the best bird seed in the Delaware Valley. So do check that out. You can join online. Um, next week, uh, this is tonight is, um, the third in a five-part series next week, we have uh, part four, uh, World on the Wing, The Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds, a wonderful writer, naturalist, scientist, Scott Widensall, who've been doing lots of research and writing about migratory birds for 20 or 30 years now, 
uh, has written a summary of the science behind migration. Uh, for example, um, birds can migrate south in part using quantum entanglement. I don't even know what that means, but it's something that Einstein pondered. Birds figured it out and use it to migrate south. So if you wanna see uh, how quantum entanglement <laughs> influences that, uh, check out Scott uh, next week. Um, we have his book on sale at our gift shop, by the way, so it could be kind of a book club um, thing where you buy the book, read it, and then come, or just listen to Scott. He's a great photographer, great speaker, great writer. Um, this photograph is shows thousands of the eight million birds that come to these uh, wetlands in the Yellow River, uh, not far from Shanghai. So it's yet another tip. It's another migration that's in trouble. Um, that's happening. That's happening all over the world. But this is Scott Widensall rolled on the wing next week uh, at this exact same time, and then the week after, in honor of Native American Heritage Month, uh, three members of the Lenape Nation are talking about the Lenape and their historic relationship to land. That's on November fourth at seven p.m. All these events are on our website. They're all free, and you need the Zoom link to come in. So. Hopefully you'll check that out. And then in mid-November, we're giving out the 16th annual Henry Meigs Environmental Leadership Award, uh, our highest honor named for a trustee who was on our board for more than 30 years, one of our founders. Um, we're giving it to Mindy Maslin on the right. She's the founder and director of Tree Tenders. She has planted or helped plant 20,000 trees across the region and trained 5,600 tree tenders who help her plant trees, volunteers that do that. So we're honoring Mindy with our award in mid-November. But tonight we're talking about um, the monarch's amazing migration and uh, getting a status report. So as I noted before, this is something of a yin-yang story. On the one hand, there's the monarch butterfly decked out in Philadelphia flyers, orange and black, an extraordinary insect that undergoes a remarkable migration. All monarchs east of the Rockies somehow find their way to a very few secluded mountain valleys in Mexico, where this Methuselah generation of insects overwinters, thousands of insects coating fir trees, clinging to the trees and each other to wait out the season. Grammarians chafe at the phrase most unique, but let's be honest, monarchs are among the most unique insects. And on the other hand, that migration is deeply troubled as monarch populations in recent decades have plummeted to be shadows of their former selves. The many possible causes include pesticides, milkweed deserts, climate change, and overlogging in Mexico. Here to celebrate the yang and worry over the yin is Dr. Orly R. Chip Taylor, an insect ecologist and professor at the University of Kansas and founder and director of Monarch Watch. Created almost 30 years ago in 1992, Monarch Watch, that's monarchwatch.org, has focused on monarch education, research, and conservation. Monarch Watch has enlisted the help of volunteers to attack monarchs during the fall migration, which has produced many new insights into the insects migration dynamics, recognizing the role that habitat plays in population loss. The organization has certified, this is amazing, some 35,000 monarch way stations across the country. Chip, we're so honored to have you with us tonight on Zoom uh, to give us a status report on the insect. Thank you so, so much for being here. And I'll stop my sharing so you can start. All right, thank you, Mike. And um, now can everybody see me? That's the question. We've got you. The way you've got me. Well, that's really good. All right, tonight we're gonna to talk a lot, of, uh, a lot about uh, monarch butterflies and we're gonna talk about the future quite a bit because I think we have to, we have to focus on the future. It's not always gonna be pleasant to, to look at what might be happening along the road, but uh, I think we have to do that and we have to understand what's been happening in the past What's like what that's likely to signal for the future and to, to get a kind of a grip on uh, where things are going. Uh, but I'm going to start with a kind of a, a, a general sort of discussion here. About a month ago, I was on a almost two hour phone call with scientists from Germany and uh, the, the most of the United States. And we were discussing the insect decline. There's, there's a a lot of papers that have been coming out in, in recent years about the declining number of insects. And there's a, a tremendous amount of activity and interest in the declining availability of pollinators to pollinate our various crops and the, the natural vegetation and so on and so forth. 
So uh, there is some dispute about how much the insects are declining, but uh, the, it's generally a discussion about abundance, not biodiversity. So there still may be the same number of species out there, but their abundances seem to be declining. And uh, while this is well documented, nobody seems to know why. We have some obvious uh, explanations. There's habitat loss that could account for some of it. Uh, there could be some climate change issues that could be some of it. But there's a lot of the decline that seems to be occurring with no obvious cause whatsoever. Declines of insects in Costa Rica where there are no pesticides used. Uh, declines right here and where I live in Kansas. Uh, we don't have, we hardly have any June bugs anymore. The May beetles are June bugs. Uh, we don't have crickets in the house in the fall. Um, we haven't seen the, the uh, uh, praying mantises that we usually see. The large moths are really scarce. And there's, the fireflies are almost gone. Um, things that we used to be experiencing in a, in a very common and abundant way uh, seem not to be there. So we got into a discussion about what might be going on and we, we just don't know. I mean, the fact is that the world is changing and we don't understand the cause and effect relationships between what is happening on the planet and what uh, seems to be happening to a lot of the wildlife out there. I mean, we, we have some ideas, but they don't seem to fit everything. So we discussed a lot of this and we came up with the possibilities that, you know, there, there could be some interesting changes going on in the vegetation alone. Um, one of the things that's coming out of the climate change research and the, the uh, agronomy that's going on, the, the agricultural in, in, interests, is that they're showing that the protein content and the nutrient content of the plants is changing and it's changing in a predictable way. And obviously that means for things that foraging on, on native vegetation, grasses and what have you, that if you're not getting the nutrients that you need per unit effort, you're gonna to have to eat more. Well, I'm not opposed to eating more, I like that, but I mean, that seems like a really good idea. We like all like to sit down and chow down, but you know, if, in terms of wildlife, there are opportunities to get more, to compensate for whatever they are not getting in the past uh, are perhaps limited. And there's a nice paper that's come out that show that grasshopper populations are functionally nutrient limited. And that has been uh, one of the things that has chased grasshopper populations down. But there are other things going on. There are lots of chemicals in the environment now chemicals that weren't there 150 years ago. Now, each one of us has probably got 100 or more <laughs> chemicals in our bodies in, in micro uh, amounts, really tiny amounts. But we have no idea what the synergistic effects might be of these different combinations of these chemicals. So that's one of the issues that we don't really understand. And then there are there's a, there is a deposition going on. And if you get on the internet and look for deposition of, of um, microfibers and microplastics and uh, simply dust and uh, mineral deposits and chemical deposits of one sort or another, there's, there's a whole um, study out there on a worldwide basis of looking at what is being deposited from the atmosphere, from the things that we actually produce and disperse around the, around the globe. And we have no idea what that's doing to any of the wildlife out there. So I think this is, you know, this is a, a dilemma that we're in. We're, we're dealing with change that we can see, that we can document, and we don't have a really good grip on what is driving it all. And that brings me to, back to, to monarchs. Monarchs are declining, and you know, we're going to talk about why they might be declining. But the fact is that we don't have a grip on all of the reasons that monarchs are declining. Anyway, I'm going to share my screen. And we'll go through some slides. We'll give me an opportunity to talk about all of this and think about it all. And um, I will go through, oh, where is it? I got to share this. All right. There's my first slide, and I guess I can just advance them. You know, I got to do this. 
That we didn't discuss. Mike, how am I going to advance that? There we go. I think we did it there. All right, monarchs and pollinators and the need for habitat restoration. So that, what that tells you is that what I'm going to lead and end up with is talking about mitigation. Things, change is underway and we have to think about how to mitigate that change. There are lots of things that are happening out there that we can't change. But one of the things we can change is we can change the amount of habitat that's available for monarch butterflies, pollinators and other things. And so we're going to end with that little bit of a discussion and what we're doing at, at Monarch Watch to initiate that kind of activity, so restoring habitat. But the bottom line is that when we're dealing with the kind of change that we're going to be talking about tonight, we have to do a lot more than restore habitat. We really have to be talking about dealing with the climate change itself. And we'll get, it, we'll get to that because, and I'll show you why we have to get to that. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about the monarch's annual cycle and the demography. Nobody really talks about demography, but I'll talk a little bit about demography. That is the, the numbers that are associated with the population. We'll talk about this, the, the declining monarch population, the loss of habitats, the breeding habitat, the overwintering habitat. We're going to talk a lot about the changes ahead, increasing temperatures, elevated CO2, altered environments, challenges and opportunities, maintaining the breeding and overwintering habitats, and so on and so forth. So th those, those are the main themes of this particular talk. Well, let's just review the annual cycle. I know most of you know this, but I, I, this is a, a map that we created showing the, most of what's going on uh, in, in one map, showing the, the two-way migration here. So right now, the monarchs are heading to Mexico with this orange arrow heading south here. We still have monarchs moving through Cape May over here in the east. We have them moving along the, the east coast. Some of them are just moving into this part of Texas down here near Port Lavaca. We have uh, Harlan Ashen down there who goes out there in the causeway and kind of tells us when the monarchs are coming along this coastal pathway. They come down this coastal pathway about 10 days, to two weeks later than they come through this part of Texas here, which goes through Del Rio and Eagle Pass. So the, the monarchs coming uh, just straight south or, or southwest out of the uh, Midwest kind of reach the Texas border about two weeks before the butterflies do from the east coast here that are coming along the, this way. Anyway, the, the, ones that, the ones that are taking long route. The, there are some monarchs who take an inner route here uh, on the other side of the mountains and come down through uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, those monarchs are probably reaching the, the border with Texas a little bit earlier than the ones that are coming along the coast. But anyway, they're heading to Mexico right now. They will arrive at the overwintering sites, almost guaranteed the first ones will be there about the 28th or 29th of October, just in time for the Day of the Dead, which is around the, the 2nd of November. There they stay over winter. They accumulate in large numbers on OML fir trees at about 10,500 feet. And they stay more or less clustered uh, through the winter. They don't move around a great deal unless the temperature allows them to go out and get some water, or they can move a little bit from one location to another, depending upon uh, uh, the sun, they're usually moving downslope a little bit during the, during the winter, always moving in a kind of southwesterly direction down a slope if they're so inclined, um, because they're catching the last sun of the day, the last heat of the day, uh, that takes them, kind of de facto takes them a little bit down, downslope toward the southwest. That doesn't always occur, but it occurs often enough, so it's of interest. And as you can see here, the, the butterflies then move north and they start moving north at the end of February and into um, early March. They usually arrive in Texas uh, in the areas which are rich with milkweed, somewhere around uh, the San Antonio area or just south of that, uh, around the 12th or uh, 13th of March. And then they begin to expand into this uh, green area as they expand into that green area, the females and males uh, mate, they, a lot of egg laying goes on there and they produce a generation of butterflies that at the end of April and through May and into the first week of June, 
moved north and they recolonized the, the rest of this uh, area in yellow. So you have a two generation return. Uh, so you have the, the overwintering generation from the previous summer returning into this green area. Most of those are dead before they uh, get up to where I am in Kansas. Uh, we do see a few now and then, but most of them are dead. They're, they have expended their reproductive capacity here in this green area. They're, they have died and uh, their offspring then carry this population uh, further north up to the, the limits of milkweed, which is around 50 degrees uh, north uh, latitude. And then we will talk about what's going on here because this area in the Corn Belt is really the area where most of the monarchs come from that reach the overwintering sites in Mexico. And we'll, we'll talk about that as we go on. So uh, the point here is, and you'll, I'll make this point again through the talk, is that monarch butterflies are effectively competing for space with all of our activities, particularly act, uh, agriculture. So uh, their population numbers are kind of dependent, very much dependent on how we use the habitat in this region, particularly from Madison, Wisconsin, over here to the middle of the Dakotas. All right, that gives you the general idea of what goes on with this uh, fall migration uh, reaching the overwintering sites, then the uh, overwintering butterflies coming north. But what I haven't told you is when the migration starts. And the migration starts usually at 50 degrees north about toward the end of the first week of August. And both of these migrations or both of these beginning points and end points have an interesting relationship to what we call the sun angle at solar noon. So the migration starts when the sun angle at solar noon in Winnipeg, which is at about 50 degrees north, drops below 57. As you know, the sun declines uh, in the fall sky, right, at, at noon. You can just see this progression day after day. It's getting shorter or smaller, smaller angle and smaller angle. And uh, the day length is becoming shorter and shorter. And so there is, seems to be a, a relationship between the migration and this declining angle of the sun, because while leaving at the, uh, at the end of the first week of August in, the, say, the Winnipeg area, they also arrive at the overwintering sites just after the sun has reached just below 57 degrees of, at solar noon. So there is some uh, aspect of the movement here that seems to be guided or referenced in some way biologically, we don't understand yet uh, this how they would be sensing these cues, but there are celestial changes that seem to be associated with this migration. And that also seems to be true in the spring, but it is a little bit less clear because the butterflies moving north in the spring are much more dependent upon uh, what the weather allows. In other words, the weather can slow them down or speed them up or what have you. So we see, uh, we see a, a pretty good relationship in the fall of, and also a partial relationship in the spring. So it seems to uh, indicate that the butterflies are using celestial information uh, to guide these migrations in some way. And that still has to be worked out. And I'm not sure how that will be done, but uh, there are lots of new biological and genetic techniques out there that will allow people to, to get at some of these questions. All right, that is a long-winded explanation for what's going on with uh, uh, this annual cycle. So now we have to talk about the natal origins of overwintering monarchs, and that gets us to an interesting discussion about what the tagging data tells us and what the, what the isotope data tells us, and I won't go into all of that, but Here's part of an isotope study that was done years ago that we contributed to. And the isotopes are extracted from the wings. The isotopes are incorporated into the wings based on the water that, uh, or that is in the plants that the, uh, the butterflies consume as caterpillars. So they are consuming uh, plant material. The plant material has certain isotopes of, of carbon and hydrogen. And that allows you to kind of, uh, believe it or not, uh, determine where they came from. And so this, this was a first cut at this. I don't think it's uh, quite accurate in terms of what's actually going on, but this, this shows that uh, in what is, or what was mostly the Corn Belt, 
uh, we get about 50% of the monarchs that, that reach Mexico. Um, uh, and you can see the overall outline at the, the breeding limit and where all the butterflies come from that get to Mexico. That's, so that's one way to look at this. Another way to look at it is, uh, and I haven't put together a slide on this, but I've just been writing this up for paper, is what Lincoln Brower told us and, and Steve Malcolm and uh, uh, a person by the name of Sieber told us years ago, and that is that uh, somewhere between 84 and 92% of the monarchs that reach Mexico uh, originated on um, a host plant known as common milkweed, which most of you are familiar with. So that would put the origins of most of the monarchs that reach Mexico really in the area of uh, north of 35 degrees north, uh, which would be Oklahoma City to the East Coast. Um, that's where most of the common milkweed comes from. So that would pretty much exclude monarchs getting to uh, Mexico from areas from 35 uh, north south of there. So, and there's quite a bit of discussion about how many monarchs come out of the Southeast? How many monarchs come out of the South or Texas to get to Mexico? And uh, so we're trying to answer that by looking at the tagging data. And uh, there are some unanswered questions here, but it generally appears that relatively few monarchs get to Mexico from South of 35 North uh, relative to the numbers that uh, actually make the distance or make the traverse from a much further North uh, latitude. Anyway, uh, this is, it gives you a start on thinking about where the butterflies come from uh, that get to Mexico. Well, this goes back now to a discussion of the habitat loss that might be occurring. And as I said earlier, we're, monarch butterflies are competing for uh, space with uh, agriculture. And this shows the, uh, uh, the areas of corn, oops, uh, the areas of corn that, um, constitute the corn belt. And of course, this is a very intensive area for soybean growing as well. So this is a, you know, you don't see this in the east where you are and in, in, uh, uh, in the eastern in the eastern states, you don't see this intensive land use quite as much as we see in the Midwest. But there's not a lot of space for wildlife in a lot of these places. Uh, it's, it's pretty solid, especially in a state like Iowa. And if you look at Iowa and how densely green it is, you get the a few places here in the south central part of Iowa which have grasslands and, and natural habitat, but uh, Iowa is pretty intense, uh, very intense in terms of corn production and soybean production. All right, let's go on to this. Yeah, and um, we are trying to extract a lot of information about what monarchs are doing based on monarch tagging, and it's it's turned out to be. Uh, a pretty good enterprise. As we started our tagging program in 1992. Uh, we got a lot of support from the people that were originally taggers, and uh, we decided to create a pulp program around it. We now have tagged to something like 2.2 million butterflies. We have about 19,400 or 500 that have recovered in Mexico, with uh, several thousand recovered uh, elsewhere. Uh, we're analyzing those data. We've got published two papers already. We've got two more papers in the works and maybe more uh, that we're planning on uh, later on. But the, the, the analysis of these data when you have such a rich database is very complex. Uh, you have to make sure everything was entered. I mean, we're talking about uh, you know 27 or 28 years of data that has been entered into a database by all sorts of students. And so you have to make sure everybody did everything right. You have to make sure that everybody read the tag codes right. Um, just a lot of checks and balances to make sure that you've got, the, um, got the, the, the read on what the data actually says. But um, that's the enterprise we're engaged in now and it's telling us quite a, uh, quite about, quite a bit about the population, where the butterflies come from. Um, that's the primary sort of thing that our carts were involved with when they first started their tagging program. But more to the point here, we're finding out not only where they come from, but the probability that butterflies from any part of the country will actually get to Mexico. And we're showing how the mi migration is influenced by the weather on the basis of this tagging data, these tagging data as well. The butterflies, the number of butterflies that get to Mexico is clearly a function of the, the conditions during the migration. 
Uh, we have extremely late migrations like we're having this year. Uh, we had two years ago that butterflies uh, that arrive in Mexico are not as abundant as we would have expected based on the numbers that, there were, that are actually tagged. If we see a, a drought in Texas, that seems to, or anywhere along the way, that seems to limit the number of monarchs that actually reach the overwintering sites. So there are a lot of things that we're picking up on with the tagging data. So uh, one of the things though that we are worried about and one of the reasons we're here is that we're talking about the, uh, the, the loss of, I'm sorry, we're talking about the loss of monarchs in through time. So if we went through 1994 to 2020, the, the, the long-term average would be 5.43 hectares. Each hectare is about uh, equivalent to about 2.2 uh, um, acres. And I should explain what a hectare means in terms of this measurement of the population. The populations are uh, accumulating in trees uh, at about 10 or 12 different massives in, in Mexico, in mountainsides in Mexico. As I said, they're accumulating on these OML fir trees at about 10,500 feet or sometimes higher, maybe a little lower on a few occasions. And what they do to get a, an assessment of the size of the population is to measure the areas of trees that are occupied um, by monarch butterflies in each of these locations. So they come up with a bunch of polygons, they uh, measure the area of these polygons, and then they add them all together and they come up with the total number of hectares of trees that are occupied by the, by the monarch butterflies. But you can see that while it was 5.43 uh, for the long-term average, for the more recent averages, it's now only 3.34. And I think if we go back uh, a little bit, look at these data a little bit more closely, we'll see that it's even less than that uh, in the more recent years. So we are concerned about this declining number and we have to understand why we got to this particular point. We have to understand what we need to do to get out of this particular low spot if we possibly can. All right. Low numbers, and we're going to see low numbers again this winter, I'm afraid, and we can talk about that later. So why are monarchs declining? Uh, we've talked about uh, glyphosate or Roundup, uh, the, the uh, agricultural industry, the, the, com the companies Monsanto and Bayer and, and uh, Syngenta and others uh, developed, uh, particularly Monsanto, developed herbicide tolerant crop lines. Herbicide tolerant crop lines mean that, that you can plant the crop and then you can go in and spray it with a herbicide that kills the weeds but doesn't kill the crop. And <clears throat> that started in the uh, late 1990s, but it really took off in the early 2000s. And so by 2006, uh, there was virtually no milkweed left in any corn or soybean fields in the Midwest. It was almost entirely gone. Milkweed had been a low level contaminant. I'll show you some pictures in a second of uh, in these fields and um, uh, these pictures that I'm going to show you, uh, you. You just can't, since 2006, you, can, you can't see milkweed in, in corn and soybean fields like we could in the past. It's just gone uh, and it's gone over a huge area. So then there were the economics of renewable fuel standard, the RFS, uh, the, uh, that issue started in 2007. We'll get into that a little bit. Conversion of rangeland and grasslands to croplands for the biofuels, the ethanol that re was required for the renewable fuel standard. Uh, we, get, we have a development issue that we don't fully understand because we're losing a lot of habitat to development. Uh, I've estimated from some source that I got that it was about two and a quarter million acres a year. It may be more or less than that, depending upon what the economics of the situation are. Then we have conversions of grasslands to crops. That seems to be continuing at about a million acres a year. So it looks like we're losing about 2 million acres a year of habitat. And then the question is, are we replacing that much habitat through aggressive restoration efforts? Uh, intensification of agriculture, which you may not be seeing in the East, but we see a lot of it in the West. They're, they're eliminating um, uh, roadways and putting them back into crops. Uh, they're uh, reducing the margins from the edge of the field to the edge of the road. Uh, and uh, they're, they're taking marginal lands and they're using them for 
agriculture and they're treating them with herbicides. Uh, we got insecticide use that, to control mosquitoes. And then we also have uh, neonics, which are uh, systemic insecticides that are being used for corn and a number of other product, uh, other crops out there that, that have probably some effect, but not, not uh, the effects aren't known. It's not like mosquito control, mosquito con control. Um, we, get, we get a report almost every year of mosquito control killing a lot of monarchs. Uh, neonics kill monarchs, but probably very subtly in a way that we don't really fully understand yet but may not be as, as bad as it is for humming or for uh, honeybees. Uh, we got de degradation of overwintering habitats in Mexico. That is going on, but it's not clear that it's really having a negative effect on the population yet. And then we have unfavorable conditions during the breeding season, which is what we're gonna be talking about with respect to weather. Uh, we can show that weather has a major impact on the development of monarch populations. And ultimately weather over a long period translates into climate. And so we're getting into the climate issues as well. So let's just talk about this habitat loss due to adoption of herbicide tolerant crops. There's my pictures of milkweeds growing in the soybean field. There's another picture of uh, milkweeds growing in a cornfield. Uh, out here in the Midwest, you've run into a lot of people that are in their 40s and 50s that just hate milkweed because if they lived on a farm, they had to go out there and chop milkweed in July uh, as kids in a hot, sticky a July weather in a hot, sticky cornfield. You, you had to take your, your knife and cut those milkweeds. And of course, it didn't do any good. They would come back up again um, because you really have to, you have to poison the plant or you have to get the roots out. And they weren't doing that. They were simply chopping milkweed and they were chopping milkweed as much to make their fields look clean, like people mow their lawns. I mean, they knew it wasn't gonna be effective at controlling the plants, but they had to make their fields look good because their neighbors would scoff at them. Yeah, interesting human behavior there. All right, well, this shows the uh, graph that we put together. And I noticed that Ernest Williams was uh, one of the people that signed up for this talk tonight. And uh, Ernest and I, and Lincoln Brower were authors of a paper in which we use this uh, particular figure to show the relationship between the overwintering hectares and the use of these herbicide tolerant crop lines. And you can see that the population started to go down, go, go down coincident with the uh, intensification of the use of these uh, herbicide tolerant plants. There's no question that it took a lot of milkweed out of the system and the monarchs responded to that in a negative way. That's no question in my mind. There seems to be question in the minds of other people who have never <laughs> seen the milkweed that used to occur in, in corn and soybean fields. But uh, it's pr pretty clear for any of us who lived in this environment and saw this, that uh, there is a relationship here between uh, the loss of milkweeds and the decline of monarch butterflies. So let's talk about the renewable fuel standard and the losses associated with that. The renewable fuel standard was signed into law by uh, President Bush in 2007, at the end of 2007, but everybody knew he was gonna sign it and they knew what it was gonna be doing. It was going to increase the amount of pressure to uh, plant a lot of corn because corn was gonna be used to produce ethanol to put in all of our gas tanks. And so even in 2007, over a million acres were converted to corn in one year, a million acres, just incredible. I mean, corn production went way up. It just, it just shot up overnight. And the result of that was that uh, in a matter of four years, we had a, a massive displacement of, of grain crops. So you can see a, a lot of this blue here uh, grain crops were actually moved to the west because uh, uh, what they wanted to do with all of these lands that were used to produce oats and barley and wheat, they wanted to produce corn on that same land. So they moved the grain crops further west. And so there was this massive conversion that took place. And it took a while to understand what was really going on. But some people got together and they said, hey, what's going on with all this land conversion. And they determined that within a four year period, 
almost 4 million acres of habitat was converted uh, to uh, was converted from one use to another. And that had the effect of uh, really changing the landscape in terms of grasslands. And grasslands, of course, contain milkweed. Those are the natural habitats of monarch butterflies. And so uh, then other uh, people came up. This was a, um, a paper that was published by people from the University of Wisconsin, Tyler Lark in particular. Uh, when he was doing his PhD, he analyzed a lot of these data and he said that of that nearly 24 million acres of habitat, 77% of that was grassland, which you know has to contain a lot of milkweed uh, because it, you know, grasslands were the real essential habitat for monarch butterflies. So this land conversion, almost the size of the state of Indiana was just uh, horrendous. And that added to the loss of milkweed. And so you put all of this together, and I'm not going to go through all of this because you don't, you don't need to know the numbers. But it's, uh, it, you know, if you bring it all together and look at the amount of corn and soybean acreage, you look at the amount of, of uh, uh, habitat losses associated with this, you, you come up with a figure at the bottom here that looks like about 174 million acres, something like that. And that may be an exaggeration, but it's it's still a lot of habitat, even if it's 100 million acres. And that's about equivalent to the state of Texas. Just that's just think about that. That's just an enormous amount of change in a relatively short time. So it's not any real serious wonder why monarch butterflies uh, began to decline as a result of this, this sort of habitat loss and habitat conversion. So. So I said 140, 174 million acres possible loss. You know, in Texas has 171 million acres. It gives you an idea of the scale of what's going on here. And of course, this is what we want to protect. This is what's so spectacular about Mexico is you can get to these um, absolutely massive numbers of butterflies. And there are lots of interesting films about all of this. Um, you know, there's the flight of the butterflies. There's a wonderful thing that was done by Louis Schwartzberg uh, for Disney, which is uh, all about pollinating insects. Um, I was advising on that particular program, actually both of them. Um, and, and it was really interesting to work with these filmmakers and to uh, understand how they had to uh, uh, picture this in order to, con you know, communicate what was at stake here in terms of losing this particular migration? So, uh, whoops, I'm sorry, I'm not used to moving this thing. So with, remarked, with regard to monarch recovery, if we wanna get this population back, uh, I have to ask a lot of questions. And I've been asking these questions since 2014, which is when this crisis actually started. And I keep asking, you know, what is our restoration target? Do we have a plan? Will efforts be coordinated? Where, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna plant milkweeds along the highways? Are we gonna uh, uh, restore native habitats in one way or another? Are we gonna get involved with uh, all sorts of native nectar plants? Uh, are we gonna do this with plugs or seeding um, in, in some way? Are we gonna do this in spring and fall? And, do we have the capacity to do this? You know, what's involved in financially? And, you know, how is this going to be implemented? And what the costs are going to be? And what have you? So I keep asking these questions, and what you know, there is no national plan. There simply is a, a hodgepodge of independent efforts uh, to uh, maintain monarch habitat. And uh, it would be nice if it was coordinated. It would be nice if we had a national vision of wanting to do this, but we. We don't seem to be getting there. We seem to be having a whole series of uh, independent, uh, uncoordinated activities. And I'm not sure that that's either good or bad. Uh, we seem to be doing some very positive things, but uh, are we doing it on a scale uh, that is sufficient to sustain this population that I don't have an answer for? Uh, as I said earlier, we are losing about 2 million acres a year of habitat that support monarch butterflies. Uh, are we sustaining that much in, in terms of our risk restoration efforts? I'm kind of skeptical about that. We may be running as fast as we can, but still losing uh, ground with regard to this population. But 
you know, it's really hard to tell because there's a lot of noise and that noise is caused by weather and weather that uh, drives the population numbers. So it's hard, really hard to factor out uh, the, the resource needs for the butterfly as opposed to what the climates and what the weather is doing uh, to this population uh, in terms of its change from year to year. All right, so that takes us into a, a different sort of thing. So if we are thinking about restoration, if we are thinking about how to sustain this population, we have to have two targets. So one of the targets really has to be this area where they come out of Mexico in the spring. We have to target this area that's producing most of those first generation butterflies. Uh, because if we're not producing a large first generation, we're not going to have a big second, third, or fourth generation if we get that at all. In other words, this population that comes out of the, this northern area at the end of each summer is highly dependent upon what happens down here in this area that is really important that supports the butterflies coming out of Mexico. You have to have a strong first generation. Uh, you have to have a lot of butterflies moving north in May and early June. Uh, to establish a population up here uh, to produce a large a fall population. So we have two targets here. We have to sustain the milkweeds in this particular area down here that uh, represents central Texas and Arkansas and so on and so forth, right up into Kansas and Missouri. And then we have to sustain this area that supports the summer population as well. So those are the focus the foci that we, we have to uh, concentrate on. All right, to do that, and this is another way to represent that, uh, the production areas, I think I'll go this through past this slide because it pretty much duplicates the other, uh, some slight differences, but the important point is that we have a corridor that runs right down through the central part of the country. We have to focus on these two ellipses and we have to concentrate on our restoration efforts there. And um, we can see, uh, I think the purpose of this slide originally was to show you um, how, what we're really competing with when we're looking for habitat for monarch butterflies. In these areas where there's white, we have a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of open habitat there. These areas that are dark green, uh, that's pretty solid agriculture. Pretty hard to get to squeeze the milkweeds in there, the nectar plants in there. Uh, we're competing for space and the monarch butterflies are competing for space. So in the uh, southern area, that area that I showed you that where the butterflies are coming out of Texas or coming into Texas and then uh, producing offspring, they're producing offspring mostly on this plant, which is Sclepius viridis or green antelope horn milkweed. And you don't see that out there in your part of the country in the east, but that's really a common plant. It's probably the second most important plant for monarchs uh, in this eastern population. And then if you go uh, further north where you all are, uh, you've got common milkweed, which I said before, according to this work that with Malcolm and Sieber and Brower uh, constitutes about 90% uh, of the feeding uh, done by fall monarchs that uh, reach Mexico. Well, in order to kind of cope with what was happening. Um, I created a program in 2005, and I'll tell you why. I created a monarch waste station program. Many, many of you are probably familiar with that. But I created this program on the basis of a letter that I got from a, a farmer in Nebraska. 2004, I got a letter from a farmer in Nebraska, and he's, he told me that, you know, I'm using these new crop lines that are uh, herbicide tolerant, and I'm using Roundup to spray my crops, and I'm eliminating the milkweeds, and I'm eliminating monarch butterflies as well. I just thought you ought to know. And I'm going, oh my gosh, he's right. This is just going to change everything. Well, Monarch Watch was struggling at that time. We didn't know whether we were going to survive from one year to the next. Um, so I didn't jump on this in, in July of that year. I could have, I suppose, but I didn't. I, it was pretty, it, it takes a while to formulate the ideas of what to do. But the next year in, uh, in June, I started a program called the Monarch Way Station Program. And the idea was to get homeowners to produce uh, 
milkweed plots among their gardens that would support monarch butterflies. And this program was very slow to start, very, very slow. But now we have 36,000 uh, registered sites. Um, at the introduction, Mike said 35. Well, Mike, we're doing well. It went up another thousand since we talked to you. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's been an interesting ride. But the idea here is to get the public to understand that we have to all pitch in and save Mark butterflies by creating habitat and we can do it. Uh, all it takes is to bring a few milkweed plants into your uh, plantings. And, um, and I'm gonna tell, tell you a little story that uh, kind of touched me seriously just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, my sister went to Northwestern University uh, and uh, she was in North, she was in Evanston, Illinois where Northwestern is a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, she went by to see my grandmother's house. My grandmother's house is, lives in, is, she lived in Evanston. And when my sister got to see my grandmother's house, she found a big patch of milkweeds out in the front lawn. Huge patch of milkweeds. I mean, really, I've seen pictures of it. It's really pretty amazing, common milkweed. Then she walked around the back of the house and there's a Monarch Way Station sign in the back, back of the house. Uh, and she sent me that and I thought, wow, that just really touched me because I'm a biologist. I'm talking to you tonight because of my grandmother. I spent three summers when I was some six to eight with my grandmother in Northern Wisconsin. And she was interested in all sorts of natural things. And she had 80 acres of property in which a river ran through. And uh, I was a little kid allowed free range on that property. And I turned over every rock and every stick and every log out there and found all sorts of wonderful things that allowed me to become a biologist. And my grandmother fostered all of that interest in me. And uh, so to find out that the person who had purchased my grandmother's house long after she had lived in it uh, had signed up for a Monarch Way station three months after I had initiated the program. <laughs> One of the early adopters just really touched me. I mean, how, it's strange how things come around. But anyway, I, that, that I'm gonna write up my, my, uh, my origin story one of these days and attribute everything to my grandmother. But uh, that's why I'm talking to you tonight. Uh, great experiences as a kid brought me to where I am today and brought me to you and let's and more about Monarch's butterflies. So let's go on with that personal story. So Monarch Way Stations started in 2005. We now have about 36,000 registered. Most of those are in homes. We have a lot in schools, but here's an interesting story about this. This thing is caught on internationally. Whoops. Uh, we now have Monarch Way Stations in eight countries. People have recognized the, the the sentiment here, I mean, the sentiment here is that, you know, it's, it's a field of dreams sort of an idea. You create it and they will come. And uh, we even have monarch way stations in areas where there are no monarchs, but there are similar butterflies like in India. Anyway, um, a curious sort of way that these things evolve and take wings and become brands. All right, in 2010, realizing that the Monarch Way Station program wasn't gonna be enough, I started a, a Monarch Habitat program called Bring Back the Monarchs. And we now have an operation where we um, distribute milkweeds through what we call the milkweed market where people can purchase milkweed plugs. We have free uh, milkweeds for schools and nonprofits and uh, Angie Babbitt who works for us uh, just informed us last week that we have distributed free milkweeds to 1,400 schools and nonprofits over the last few years. And then we have free milkweeds for restoration. That project is, over, is underwritten by uh, corporate uh, contributions, not money that we have, but uh, corporate, corporations give us money and we use that money to distribute free milkweeds for restoration. But whoever receives these milkweeds has to pay for the, the shipping. In other words, they have to have some skin in the game. 
So since 2010, we've distributed over 1 million milkweed plugs. And that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, but you know, the bottom line is that we need probably almost, almost 1.6 billion, that's billion with a B, milkweed plugs out there in the landscape to get this population back to where it needs to be. So the task is big. Uh, one, one million milkweeds is more than anybody else is doing or anybody else has done, but it's, it's, it's really trivial. 36,000 monarch way stations, I like it. It's great. It's a mark of achievement, but we need 3,600,000 monarch way stations. I mean, we, we need a lot of habitat out there. There's no question about it. We're dealing with a, a widely distributed species. We're dealing with one that uh, where we're having a diminishing um, um, landscape out there for the, to support this species. And uh, we're dealing with a changing climate as well. All right, and let's get to that changing climate thing. Well, I just looked up things for you um, about CO2 because I'm really concerned about CO2. CO2 is what's driving the weather. It's driving the climate. Uh, CO2 to uh, yesterday was 214 parts per, or 414 parts per million. Um, oops, that was yeah, 2021. Uh, 2020, uh, 20 October 20, it was uh, 4, 411. Uh, it's going up every year uh, with all of the fires this past two years. Um, it'll go up even more, go up even faster. It's going up about two and a half parts to 2.8 parts per million per year um, uh, over a series of years. And it's probably gonna go up to about four parts per million per year pretty soon. And that's scary because you can see this record here that you can look up every day, you can follow it. We're at the very lowest point of the year for CO2. By the time we get to CO2 next April, uh, after the winter, we're gonna be looking at somewhere around 400, uh, 420, 421 parts per million. So we're not only worried about the greenhouse gas known as CO2, but we're worried about methane. And methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases are all important in this greenhouse gas effect that is heating the planet. Um, methane is a real concern because methane emissions are largely under control. Uh, there's not a whole lot going on to really control methane emissions. And uh, the permafrost is beginning to melt in uh, Siberia uh, and into the, the northern parts of, of our uh, continent and the a release of a lot of methane is going to have a major impact on the climate. It's probably going to be, in the short term at least, much more significant than CO2. We don't have really good measures of the amount of methane out there, but as a greenhouse trapping, heat trapping gas, it's 25% or 25 times more potent than uh, CO2 is. So it's kind of scary out there. It's one of those things that we don't fully have a grip on in terms of the, the magnitude of it but uh, it could have a major effect on what's going on. And so it could change, could result in really rapid changes in the climate, much more than we can um, forecast right now because we can't determine how fast that methane is gonna be released. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a concern and we have to watch it. All right, let's see if we can go on here. All right, when was the last time CO2 levels, levels were this high? How about 5.3 to 2.6 million years ago? Long before human beings were on the planet. So last time CO2 levels this, were this high was a long time ago when the earth was several degrees warmer, sea levels were estimated 50 feet higher than they are today and forests grew as far north as the Arctic. Well, um, 50 feet higher would put a lot of us underwater, wouldn't it? We don't wanna be there. So we have to do something about these greenhouse gases. Otherwise we're gonna lose a lot of things including monarch butterflies. So I'll give you an idea of the kind of changes that we see this, you can find this graph for a lot of different places. You can see that um, things really began to change after the 1940s um, and that, that brings us to where we are today. 
and the change that is still going on. This is something I put together uh, a, a while back. And what this shows is the rate of change per decade from 1975 onward um, for the growing season, which is May through September. Uh, in some places, the growing season is a little bit longer, but it's still, uh, I've checked that, and it's still the same sort of relationship. So look what's happening in the West. 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit change per decade since 1975. And if you go into specific places like Carson City, Nevada, it's 0.8 degrees Fahrenheit. If you go down to uh, Savannah, Georgia, because the ocean temperature around Savannah, Georgia is changing really fast. Uh, Savannah, Georgia itself, just the city of, of Savannah, but not the whole state, uh, is changing really fast. So things are changing fast, particularly along the coast. So if you look at this, you see the West Coast is high values. Texas has a relatively high value. Then you see all these fours and fives, and then six, sevens uh, along the East Coast. All of that reflects the fact that the ocean is getting warmer. So the ocean temperatures are having an influence on the continental temperatures. And then you see that the, the area of least change, which is good news for the marks, are the, the Dakotas and Iowa, Minnesota, uh, Oklahoma, uh, Kansas and Oklahoma, and Missouri. That central corridor is not changing as fast. And there's a reason for that. And the reason has to do with the position of the jet stream. The jet stream sits over Canada, north of the Dakotas and Minnesota, uh, considerably north of there. But it has an influence on the temperatures in the Midwest. Now, there was a discussion on television the other day that um, had to do with what the unpredictability of the jet stream. And the jet stream occasionally dips a little bit. 2004 and 2009, the jet stream dipped into, dipped lower into Canada and had a major impact. And those were two of the coldest summers that we've seen in, the, in that century, in this century. You know, position of the jet stream determines summer temperatures. If the jet stream takes a wild run and goes further north, it's gonna get really hot in the Midwest. And it has for on particular years. 2012 was a terrible year for the Midwest. And 2012 tells us something about what's probably going to be happening in the future. All right, give you a couple more looks at what the, what's going on in the data in terms of uh, change. Look at this is something I put together for California. If you look at 2000, for 1901 to 1930, the temperatures were, you know, 68.4. You go the next 30 years, there's 69.4. Another 30 years, it's only 69.5. Hasn't really changed much. And then all of a sudden, boom, you're going up there. It's in, in the next 30 years, it changes by, uh, you know, 1.4 uh, 1. Uh, degrees. So this, you know, this is telling you that there's, there's just this rapid change that's occurring in California. And so it's, it's no wonder that California is really concerned about water, and, uh, the number of uh, uh, crops out there that are water dependent. And with these temperatures, crops are gonna have to shift a little bit in California. Certain crops are no longer gonna be grown in California in, in, in another decade or two because uh, it's just gonna get to be too hot. All right, so how do temperatures affect monarch populations? Well, I'm going to introduce you to a wild idea here. Monarchs are an enzyme. This brings up a you know, kind of an interesting discussion that we had today. You know, we're, we're talking about research initiatives at the university. And I'm long since retired, but I'm, not, I'm still pretty doggone active. And I participated in a conversation this morning and, and uh, the conversation that was, was basically started around the, the idea that we would uh, have a new research initiative, which we would call the, the Earth Forecasting Institute or institution or center, Earth, Earth Forecasting Center, I guess it was going to be. And we got into an interesting argument because one of the academics in the group said, hey, you know, 
we, we can't really forecast anything accurately. We can't really forecast the weather. We can't do this and we can't do that and, and so on and so forth. And anybody who was really into academic forecasting would laugh at the idea that we were gonna have a forecasting center because it just can't be done in, you know, in a finite way. Well, I'm going, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a, there's a kind of a general way of, of understanding forecasting. And then there's this academic intensity of understanding for forecasting where you, you want to really be super active or super accurate and you have to have all of these data that uh, give you the, the ability to forecast. And I'm saying, wait a minute, the, the, there's an awful lot of things that we know about organisms, that we know about the environment that may not allow us to give precise forecasts, but we can give a predictions. Right? We can predict what's going to happen. Every crop out there has an optimal range of temperatures at which it will grow. It has optimal nutritional requirements. It has optimal inc incident radiation requirements. You know, so everything out there has a, a, a range of finite characteristics that define its ability to grow. It's genetically determined capacity to respond to environmental change, which means that environmental change changes the outcome. And so in order to kind of explain this to the general public and, and to my colleagues, I'm saying, and, and I shouldn't have to explain this to my biological colleagues, and I really don't, but to, you know, to the rest of us to talk about what an enzyme is, we don't know exactly what an enzyme is, but it's a protein that determines a rate limiting function. And so enzyme activity in terms of, of uh, activating various reactions biologically, enzyme activity is temp temperature dependent. So there is a developmental zero on one end and a developmental zero on the other end, and then there's an optimum. So there's a peak and there's a range around that peak. And if you look at this particular curve, what you can see is that if there's a slow rise in the curve from low temperatures. This doesn't represent any particular species. This is just kind of a generalized curve. So you see that it starts at a very low activation at low temperatures, then it increases and it reaches a peak. And then after that peak, it drops really fast. In other words, you don't have to go very far past the peak to see that the, the, the consequences are going to be really dire for the population. In other words, if you get to the right of that blue line, uh, you can't go very far before you, you get into some serious consequences. So monarch butterflies have a developmental zero of about 52 degrees. So if you have caterpillars and, or butterflies and you're interested in their activity, you find that they, they can't do anything if it gets 52 degrees. They can't eat, they just sit there. They can't fly, they just sit there. 52 degrees, it's developmental zero. They just, they metabolize, and they, if you hold them at 52 degrees for a very long time, they'll just die. They can't do anything. They can't acquire any nutrients. They can't function, they have to just live off their reserves. Then if you go uh, f further, you find that eventually you get to about 82, 84, 86 degrees, and then you're talking about the optimal conditions for monarch functioning on our growth. And then you go past that. And by the time you get to 91 or 92 degrees, you are also at developmental zero. In other words, the butterflies can't do anything. If once you get into the low 90s, they are non-functional, pretty much non-functional. They have to seek really cool temperatures once they get into the 90s. And then they, they really can't do very much in the 90s. And so that you know you have this relatively narrow band in which everything is functioning. And I got to looking up corn and soybeans, and it turns out the corn and soybeans have pretty much the same optimum as the monarch butterfly, which is interesting. So if you've been looking at this slide, and you can see that, you know, the most insects, uh, uh, the developmental zero, the lowest one is 53, the highest one is 51, optimal is 84. And then you get into lethal temperatures and so on and so forth. And you look at plant development and you look at human beings and we're enzymes too in this 
concept. We have our lower limits and we have our upper limits as well. So we are living on the same sort of a bell-shaped curve. The difference is that human beings can move in and out of buildings and we can use air conditioning and what have you. And we can, we can modify our environments. None of these other organisms and none of these plants can modify their environments. They're subject to whatever the environment gives them. And what the environment gives them in the case of weather changes is it was that blue line is pushed a little bit to the, not the, the optimal line, but if you, the temperatures are pushed a little bit to the right of that blue line, then you have negative consequences in terms of population growth. If you're way down and uh, on the left side of that, you also have negative consequences in terms of population growth. So this is, you know, the term we use in biology is realized fecundity. Realized fecundity goes down, mortality goes up either way, realized fecundity goes down. And the severity of the impact being uh, is much uh, greater when you have higher temperatures than it is if you have lower temperatures. Lower temperatures allow the organisms to live a little bit longer, higher temperatures uh, shorten their lifespan, shorten their reproductive potential even faster. Well, that's just a little basic biology that leads to demography, that leads to the discussion of what's really happening on a kind of a worldwide basis for a lot of organisms. We're pushing the temperature, we're pushing it past the optimal functioning level for a lot of the species, and there are going to be a lot of consequences because species are not really flexible enough to change their optimal operating temperatures. Well, uh, that's just a little basic uh, microbiology under, you know, um, microbiology, um, I say met metabolic biology. And uh, um, anyway, let's talk about negative outcomes when you push your temperatures for pollinators. You get uh, reduced longevity, lower realized fecundity, uh, lifetime reproductive success is reproduced, you're compromised. Survival of offspring can, uh, can be also be a problem there with uh, when you push these temperatures up there. Lower populations of following generations or seasons. And so lower populations in one year or a one generation and a multi-generation species uh, can just kick the living daylights out of the rest of the generations, can't it? And then in plants, you get reduced seed set, higher abortion rates of seeds, lower protein and nutrient content, reduced seed viability, and so on and so forth. So this may be a little bit more biology than you want to talk about in terms of monarch butterflies, but it's all relevant because these are, these are the sorts of negative outcomes that we're going to be seeing with uh, increased temperatures. Um, so, you know, if we sum all this up in terms of a simple sentence, there can be a negative, uh, a cascade of ne negative effects of temperatures significant that can significantly exceed long-term averages uh, effects that can be amplified if droughts occur simultaneously. I kind of messed up the, that sentence, but you get the idea. If you bring together these long-term, look at these deviations from long-term temperatures and you combine that with a drought like we're doing in California right now, uh, or we see it in Texas from time to time as monarchs move south, uh, you get these amplified effects that can carry over from one year to the next and from gener certainly from generation to generation. Um, so uh, just again, remind you that uh, we, we've distributed, you know, in terms of mitigating, we have to mitigate uh, what's going on here and we're mitigating with uh, distributing a lot of milkweed plugs. If you guys want to get involved with uh, this sort of thing and, and in terms of the East Coast, we can help you out. We have uh, on our website, we have a lot of uh, um, nurseries uh, identified that are, uh, aside from the ones that we work with, that are distributing milkweeds that have uh, local provenance and uh, could be used in your gardens or uh, your restoration plots and so on and so forth. And I think with that, I want to finish just with one parting thought. Um, and this is because I'm involved in a lot of pollinator activities. I'm Kind of co-chair of a, a group, uh, uh, a group talking about how to create a white paper about pollinators to talk about the overall things that are going on here. So let me just read this for you. Uh, this is something I wrote as part of this group uh, as kind of a leading statement to justify what we were looking at, and what we we're doing. 
The rhythms of life shaped by millions of years of evolution are being challenged and altered by our rapidly changing climate. The connections long established between plants and their pollinators are of particular concern since these interdependencies shape can't read it because I can't see that they, they shape uh, nearly all of our terrestrial ecosystems. Our future will be defined by how well we understand and maintain these connections. You know, 70% of the native vegetation out there and most of the ecosystems that we are dependent on is dependent on pollinators. And these, all of these relationships are threatened right now because of the insect apocalypse, the decline in pollinators in general. Um, and there's already evidence that plant diversity is decreasing as a result of the lack, lack of uh, pollinator diversity or pollinator uh, abundance. So we have to be concerned about a lot of different things. I've told you a little bit about monarch butterflies, but um, you know, monarch butterflies are simply a way of telling us a lot of things that are going on in the environment at this particular time. We need to pay attention to monarchs because they are telling us these things. And these things are uh, important for the next generation and the generation after that. We need to be aware of what's going on. We need to be thinking ahead and looking ahead. And I'm afraid that for, you know most of us are, most of our populations around the world are, either too busy trying to survive or too comfortable to be concerned. Uh, and we need to change that dynamic. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm pleased to have been able to talk to you tonight. Oh, Chip, okay. thank you. That was, that was really extraordinary. Thank you so much. I'll be glad to answer questions. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, would you mind stop sharing? Um, and then yeah, we can see you. I can stop sharing, yes. There, we there you are, great. That was extraordinary, it was so complete. Um, so let's see, it's 8.20, we're gonna go for 10 minutes um, and you can sign off anytime if you, if you need to. So we'll, we'll sort of do kind of rapid fire questions if you don't mind, Chip, does that work for you? Oh, that's fine. I'll try to keep the answer short and stop, stop being such an academic. No, 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 it, it was just wonderful. Um, early on, a lot of people were still noticing monarchs and caterpillars in places like Long Island, Maine, Virginia, Detroit. So is that still, those are butterflies likely not going to make it to Mexico. Does that sound fair? Yeah, that happens every year. That happens every year. And it, we see a lot more of it uh, when we have uh, late summers, when we have, uh, particularly when we have warm uh, Septembers. Right. Yeah. Um, Joy wants to know where the closest place to fill you to see the monarch migration. I bet many people can put the answer in chat, but Chip, what would you say? Well, if you really want to see what's going on along the East Coast, go to Cape May. Cape May Point. Go to Cape, right at Cape May Point. Yeah, right. Yep. yep. So they, they funnel down New Jersey and get to Cape That's May right. Point and then yeah. jump across. Just got an email the other day that they're still moving along the, the New Jersey coast. And they're very, very late. And they may not make it to Mexico, but you'll still get to see this. This drive to reproduce in this butterfly is really extraordinary. I mean, oh, Anna's here. She, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I mean, that, that, that's one of the things that's so striking about the migration. That's one of the things that's so striking about all of this. You know, here, here you have an insect that weighs half a gram, and it, it'll fly from uh, Prince, you know, Prince Edward Island in, in, in the Maritimes all the way to Mexico. It would take them approximately three and a half months to make that traverse. And then they, and they get there, and they have a broken wing, and they're dead. You know, I mean, it's just, but they have to get there. This is the drive. This is the drive to replicate. It's it's so, so inherent in all of life that we don't see it often, but you can see it in this butterfly in a marvelous way. Anne teaches our kindergarten class at the Nature Center, and she's also um, involved in tagging butterflies. So she tagged five this year, um, raised on Asclepias syriaca. Is that the yes, swap Oh, that's common. That's, that's common. common, okay. And released at the Nature Center in our Founders Bureau. So thank you, Anne. That's great. And the kindergarten class got to participate in that. Did grassland prairie before farming occur to the Midwest by white people support more milkweed than farms in the pre-Roundup era? When was the era of milkweed's heyday? That's, that's a 
That's a good question. I mean, we, we have a hard time understanding what ex actually existed on the prairies uh, in the past, but uh, evidently they supported a large number of monarch butterflies. And most of the prairies had to, uh, 10 to 14 species of milkweeds in them. And they didn't all bloom at the same time. So they're, they're kind of a sequence of use of these plants on the, in the prairies. And they produced large numbers of, of monarch butterflies in the fall. I mean, we, we know that from historical observations. Um, and so we can presume that uh, milkweeds were really abundant to, while the prairies were abundant and uh, milkweeds were probably pretty abundant right up until the uh, Second World War because uh, corn was not really, um, it was not really managed as well as it, it, as it was after that. And there was probably a lot of milkweed in corn and, uh, and so on. There was kind of a, a peak of corn production around 1946. And um, so I'm, I'm assuming that the landscape had a lot of milkweed in it uh, around that time. Thank you. Janet wants to know if you approve of individuals raising monarch indoors. Uh, she's heard that, that that might be raising weaker monarchs. Yeah, we were writing a paper about uh, reared monarchs versus wild monarchs. And, you know, wild monarchs get to Mexico at about twice the rate that uh, reared monarchs do. And there's a lot of reasons that, we're, a lot of reasons that reared monarchs uh, don't make it to Mexico. And I mean, people tag everything, and so, including a lot of monarchs are obviously not going to make it. People tend to rear and, uh, and tag monarchs uh, too late to, me to make it to Mexico. And that's Another thing that take, you know, reduces the probability of getting to Mexico. And then we find that a lot of people who are doing rearing are doing the rearing in the Northeast where you all are. And the monarchs from that region have a lower probability of getting to Mexico than wild monarchs do. So you know, there are a lot of different things going on here. And uh, what we do know, what we can tell you is that if you rear monarchs outdoors on living plants in some sort of cage situation, uh, they have a really good chance of getting to Mexico. Ed wonders if monarchs move, can move to a new area of optimal temperatures if climate change continues. Yeah, there's been a lot of discussions of this because one of the things that has been um, thought about is the possibility that the distributions of milkweeds will change. So milkweeds will move to the Northeast and move to the North and Northwest. And the, the problem with that is that uh, the plants aren't going to move fast enough. You know, they're simply going to be eliminated in the in, in this the southern parts of their distributions. Um, and you know, how monarchs will deal with that is is a, kind of an open question. And I looked at this research-wise for the proposed movement of common milkweed into the northwestern part of the distribution. It just, it, it doesn't look like monarchs get there, get, get to, they either, they don't get to those places in the spring, nor do they get to their overwintering sites from those places in the fall. So, yeah, I mean, you've got a lot of things to consider here when you're, when you're moving the plants around. We have a couple of questions about using plugs versus using seeds. Um, do you recommend one versus the other? And Sarah wonders uh, if you have advice for growing milkweed from seed because she can get lots of seeds around. Yeah, so this is a, a very common question. Uh, and we, we use plugs because you get kind of an instant gratification with plugs. Um, I mean, we've had people put plugs in the ground and they turn them around and their butterflies already laying eggs on them 10 minutes after they put them in the ground, you know? so so. And that's not exactly what we want to have happen. We want them to grow before the monarchs eat them up. But the, the point here is that plugs give you kind of an instance sort of thing that, you know, by the end of the, we give them away to schools and by the, in the spring and by the fall, the kids have got caterpillars in the, on the milkweeds in the, in the school gardens and that's great. Uh, the problem with seeds is it usually takes about three years to get a really good stand with something with seeds. Uh, I mean, that is if you're broadcasting or, or drilling in seeds, it takes a while for that to, to really take hold, usually about three or four years. I've done a little bit of that and it takes a while. Uh, you just have to be patient. But as far as germinating seeds is concerned, they have to be stratified. And so what we recommend for common milkweed or swamp milkweed is that you take the seeds, keep them, uh, keep, keep them cool and dry. And then about six weeks before 
uh, you want them to germinate, you put the seeds in a uh, bag with moist uh, vermiculite. Uh, vermiculite sterile or reasonably sterile, and of course it doesn't kind of have any fungus on it. And you put the seeds and mix it in with moist uh, vermiculite and put that in a refrigerator for four to six weeks before you take them out and plant the seeds and that'll stratify them. Um, so put them in the bag, put the date on them, and put a reminder on your refrigerator to tell you, tell you to take them out by um, let's go ahead, you know, six weeks later. Just a couple more questions. Why would the ones that start on their migration late not make it to Mexico? Good question, but they run out of nectar resources. Um, it, it many, many of the monarchs that are late in the migration tend to be smaller. They've got a lower um, uh, glide ratio. Uh, they're less efficient at, at getting it. They, if they're smaller, they have less of a, a fat body as well, less able to, to make the whole trip. Well, last question. I know there's been lots of talk about whether the monarch should be declared endangered, and I believe the government recently decided not to, correct? So should they be? Should we, should we write to people to ask about this? I, I think we would have to wait. Um, I mean, we've got enough monarchs now. We've got enough habitat right now. What we're worried about is the, the you know, tremendous overwintering mortality in Mexico or some a weather event that takes a large part of the population out. Um, barring that, I think the monarchs are okay for a while, uh, but you know we we could end up with a, a Western monarch situation where the population could go down very fast. But what they're going to do is they're, they're going to evaluate the monarch population for the next three year, three years before they make a decision, and as to whether it should be considered to be threatened or endangered. Um, I don't think we need to go there yet. I think we've 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 got work to do, and we can probably do something, but. You know, hey, in the long run, unless we do something about the changes that are going on out there uh, in terms of climate change, we are going to be faced with that decision. Dr. Chip Taylor, University of Kansas Monarch Watch, the founder of Monarch Watch for almost 30 years and 36,000 Monarch way stations. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your time tonight. It's just so special to talk with you. Next week, everybody, is Scott Widen's Hall here at the same time, 7 o'clock, World on the Wing, Migratory Birds. Everybody, feel free to unmute yourself and, and say thank you to Chip for, for the wonderful evening. Thanks, Chip. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Chip. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chip. Thank you. Go to Cape May. Go to Cape May, everybody. Hey, I like the, I like the shirt. It's got Monarch Watch on it. <laughs> That's Ann, our kindergarten teacher. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. All right. Taylor. <laughs> All right. Thank you very All much. Right. All right. Bye bye. Good talking to y'all. Bye. 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 Good night. Good night. Good to see you, Sarah. <laughs> Wonderful yeah. program. Thank you so much. Chip, thank you. Have a great night. All right. Thank you, Mike. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Good night. Bye. -bye.